It's great to see all of you this morning. Um, we're not an isolated church. The body of Christ is intimately connected across great distances. And I found that last week. I went to speak at uh, Greenfield Park Baptist Church, which is on the South Shore. Um, it's further than I thought. Uh, I don't think I crossed a time zone, but it was probably a sh close thing. Um, but it, it's there are differences. There are little subtle differences that you see when you walk into any church. Uh, you'll just see differences in, in sort of the church culture, differences in how people interact, differences in the preaching, uh, different versions of the Bible show up up front. Uh, and these are all things that we expect. Um, we are different in tone and musical style in dress code. And it got me thinking, when we talk about one church, one body of Christ, what are we talking about? What is it that unifies us in spite of distance and difference. So I want to start by turning to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, Peter, uh, writing to the churches in, uh, in Asia Minor, he writes, Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If you're a Christian, you are begotten, you're born, you're not made, you're definitely not self-made. And of course, we all know that when a baby arrives in this world, they're not generally happy. They don't come out congratulating the doctor, doctor and thanking the nurses for their service. Or maybe asking for a carrot to take the edge off. If I remember rightly, the one thing that they want when they arrive in this world is their mother's milk. Nothing else will do. It has everything they need to grow. It has all the vitamins, all the nutrients. It even has the mother's antibodies as their own immune system is growing up for them to be able to fight off infections. But of course, they don't come out with a chemical test kit either. They're not checking to see whether it has all the right stuff. There's an instinct in them and a craving and a need in them to get that mother's milk. And it's critical. And there's a, there's a deep part of them that knows that. Well, here, as we look at this passage, we see that that is what Peter is talking about as well. He's talking about pure spiritual milk and the craving that goes with our lives as Christians and our standing before God when we think about the Word of God. Now, don't misunderstand. Paul often uses this milk image. And he often uses it in contrast. He speaks about those who are younger in the faith, just getting to know scripture. And he speaks about milk as opposed to meat, as opposed to something that is heavier and richer and deeper as you advance in your faith. But that's not what Peter's doing. There's no contrast here. He's not speaking to the new, newborn in the faith. He's speaking to anybody and everybody, whether they've been in the faith 30 years or 30 minutes. He is speaking about that craving and saying it should always be fresh and new and real. Uh, when you read the, the book of 1 Peter, you realize he's speaking to those who've been persecuted in their faith. He's speaking to those uh, churches where Paul had established the faith and raised up leaders. He is speaking to people who many of us might think should have moved on to something more than pure spiritual milk. Their craving should be something for something greater. But for Peter, he speaks to them, and, and he's saying you don't get to graduate. He's saying you don't get to drop off all the kids' stuff at the local Salvation Army. This is not something where you're moving on, and it's a new stage in life. He's saying go back to that craving for pure spiritual milk. And what exactly does he mean by pure spiritual milk? What's he talking about? Well, you go back a couple of verses, he's speaking about the word of God. And as he puts it, this word is the good news that was preached to you. It's the message of the gospel. There's no stage in your Christian lives where you step away from the message of the gospel and say, this is not a need that I have anymore. Let's get into some deep theology. The message of the gospel, it always speaks to us, always will. So, 
We're gonna talk milk today. We're gonna talk about that basic good news. And it takes many forms, but one of the traditional forms that I think it's important to speak to is something called the Apostles' Creed. It's very well known in Western Christianity, and it's something that I wanna speak to today. Before we start, and before I read through it, let's take a moment to pray and really give this time to God, give our hearts to God, have them opened by God. Lord, we are grateful that uh, as we um, come before you, we can trust that you change hearts. Uh, we can trust that uh, you speak through uh, any instrument. And um, that's, that's, that's the power that you have to move us. Uh, and, and God, we're so grateful for that. We're so grateful that you are a transforming God and that you use the details of the time that we spend together. You use passages that we see in Scripture, and you use the simple and straightforward message of the gospel to bring us back or to renew us uh, for the very first time as we come before you. We're grateful that you love us. In Christ's name we pray. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is called a creed. I said this is called the Apostles' Creed. What does creed mean? We just get that from the words, I believe. So this is the I believe of the early Christian church. But the words that I just spoke, you're not going to find them in the Bible. There's no chapter and verse for them. There are all kinds of other deposits of the faith that have been brought to us that we do know uh, we can find them in a specific place in Scripture, like the Ten Commandments or the Lord's Prayer, but not this. You may recognize the Apostles' Creed. After all, in many churches, it's recited every Sunday morning uh, without notes. It's sung by the congregation, put to all kinds of music. It's put in the form of questions and answers during a baptismal service. Or often, it's brought to God in prayer every morning by many believers. St. Augustine, who was one of the leaders in the North African church in the early centuries, he advised his flock to have this creed before them first thing in the morning as they wake up and last thing as they go to bed. Now, that probably only describes iPhones these days. But this was his advice, advice to his flock. In one form or another, it or something like it has been a part of the Christian life since the very first followers of Jesus in the apostolic age. Now, the Apostles' Creed, like I said, has no chapter and verse. What it is, is a traditional summary, an outline of the Christian faith that has united Christian believers in a single communion across continents, oceans, political stripes, language barriers. Uh, and I know that there are huge differences in churches. I mentioned some subtle ones. There are less subtle differences. Uh, I remember uh, my, my wife is Kenyan. We went to a Kenyan church a, a few times. And um, yeah, they do things differently. Uh, the, there were, the services were longer. The preaching went on for longer. People were a little later. Um, the, the singing, the worship was deep and rich and went on for a long time. And we did the Congo line <laughs> up and down the aisles. And I had, to, I had to do it. Everyone was doing it. When is the last time we did the Congo line? <laughs> there are differences. There are really obvious differences. But I spoke about the connections between churches. What I knew when I attended that church, when the word was preached, what I knew is that we had a common confession what I knew is that if someone used the word gospel, we were all hearing the same thing by it. We all knew that it referred to our own salvation through the blood of Christ shed on the cross. We knew the good news and we knew it was for us and we shared it. There was a common confession. Now, this is, as I said, a traditional expression of that unity that exists between 
cultures and peoples that are vastly different. But I use that word again, traditional or tradition. It's an unhappy word. It's an uncomfortable word for some, particularly for those in the Baptist tradition. What do we do with it? The word tradition is certainly to be found in the Bible. And and I want to take a few minutes just to talk about it, because I think it's important. If we're going to talk about the Apostles' Creed, a part of you might just snap off and say, I don't want to hear this. This is a tradition. I'm not interested in it. I just want to hear Scripture. That's, That's very valid, and I hear that. So what do we do with this idea of tradition? Well, it's found in the Bible, and very often we see Jesus speak to it, and he has this clarion call to release your grip on those traditions which are keeping you back from God, holding you back from hearing God's actual voice and obeying it. We see that in Matthew 23, verse 23, when Jesus says, and and he's speaking to the the Pharisees here. I think it's important to mention, the Pharisees are one of the Jewish sects in that time, in the first century. And it so happens that they had a very warm relationship with the idea of tradition. They were known as those who create a hedge around Torah, around scripture, those who are protecting it to ensure that it is entirely fulfilled by making up lots of rules that will ensure that we're all on the same page and doing the same thing. So they had rules for every detail of their life. And that, conti- that, that, was, a, that was something that was pressed on the people around them. Jesus spoke to that in Matthew 23. He said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. He's more direct still in Mark chapter 7, verse 8. You've let go of the commands of God, and you're holding on to human traditions. Of course, his concern here, the nature of the rebuke is clear. The finer points of the law or human traditions are not the problem. They're only the problem when they obscure the things of God, when they draw you away from the things of God. It is then that they become something which which is damaging to our faith, which needs to be laid aside. Tradition itself is, yes, often cast in a negative light in Scripture, but the term is is entirely neutral. The word in Greek is paradosis, and it simply means that which is handed over. It can be a noun or a verb, the thing handed over, or something being handed over. I've known a lot of bad things that are handed over, but think of it as a relay race. There's this baton that's passed from one athlete to the next. It is just a stick that's getting passed from one person to the other. It can be, it's very neutral. But I've known bad things that are handed over. If you come in, if you were born in a family with a few kids, uh, you know something called hand-me-downs. That would probably be a good good translation of the word paradosis. Hand-me-downs. Yeah, I handed down stuff to my younger brother. And yes, I realized that I had probably eaten uh, peanut butter and jam sandwiches in those snow pants, and that there were the stains to prove it. But they were still good snow pants, and it's fine. I handed them over. But I don't want to talk about what my older sister handed over to me. Those hand-me-downs were not okay. It can have a very bad connotation. Even worse, that very same word is translated in some parts of the New Testament as betrayal or arrest, as in Jesus was handed over to the chief priests uh, to be killed. It can have a very negative meaning, but can it also be good? That's a question I have for you. Is there such a thing as a good handing over, a good tradition? And it's a good question. It's hard for me to say yes. I don't have necessarily a comfortable relationship with tradition, but the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Paul, Paul writing to those in Thessalonica, he says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. The word is the same. It's traditions. And he's speaking very positively about them. 
Showing our own discomfort, though, there are modern translation which give it as give the word teachings in its place. There's just this discomfort, but I think it's badly rooted. It's rooted in a misunderstanding about our own Protestant tradition and where that comes from. There's a strange thinking that goes on wherein the Reformation happened 500 years ago and there was a totally fully corrupt church and what they did is they abandoned and threw out all tradition and started fresh just the Bible, sola scriptura. Sort of true. Not really though. There were some very radical groups who did exactly that. They said any tradition which is passed down to us is bad, all by itself. We dump it, we get rid of it. Uh, for instance, the Anabaptists and some of the other more extreme groups that were short-lived, that were flashes in the pan, which came and then disappeared. But those reformers that left a great legacy, like Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin, what they did instead was to dismiss tradition as being an equal of Scripture. And they said, no, it is not an equal. They gave it what they called a ministerial role. It's a servant of Scripture. It is under Scripture. Scripture is the fundamental of what we share in our faith. And if any tradition was something that was handed down from the early church, from early times, it was rooted in Scripture, it was centered on Christ, and it gave glory to God and pointed back to a reliance on His Word, you know what? They taunt on it. They passed it down. They shared it. They agreed with it. So if there is a baton that is handed to you and it is supported by Scripture, run with it. A handing over can be a sensitive thing, though. The message of the gospel is not such an easy thing necessarily to hand over. We can go back to the relay race image. I think it works well. Uh, I've been in relay races as uh, a teenager, and we had a great team, and we, we thought we could get the top place. We thought we would win. And so uh, we started off, and the first guy on the first leg of the run, he stumbled, literally rolled, and got back up. Well, he got up, and we caught up. It ended up being okay, and we did pretty well. That wasn't the sensitive moment. The sensitive moment was that handoff, that moment when one athlete gets to the other, hands off that baton, and it can go badly. If you do it too early, if you do it too late, you're disqualified. If he hands you a, a medium rare steak instead of the baton, in a couple of hours later, you would say, uh, thank you, this looks delicious, my compliments to the chef. But at that moment, that's not what you're saying. This is not the thing that should be hand it over. More importantly, if you have kids, what you realize is that the wisdom you've acquired, the lessons you've learned, all the things that you want to pass on, it's actually more difficult than that. They say, okay, 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 dad, I, I hear you, but, and then they go and learn the same lessons themselves the hard way. Handing over is difficult. The early church realized that handing over was difficult. There have been always those who wanted to substitute that pure spiritual milk. They wanted to put something else in its place. They've wanted to, to substitute their own ideas, their own thoughts, their own philosophies. When heretics in the early centuries wanted to prove that their tradition was the right one, they would actually make up the names of followers of the early apostles so that they could say, hey, we got, we got handed down to us this secret tradition, which is actually the right one. They knew that tradition had a strong effect. As Irenaeus put it, one of the early Christians, they mixed chalk in with the milk. Same color, but it's not the real thing. It's why we need to be grounded in Scripture, and it's why we need the, the centrality of the message of the gospel to, to be what we turn back to constantly, what we constantly renew. It was long thought important that the Christian church hand things over with care, hand the gospel over with care and wisdom. They took it deeply, seriously. So much so that they had all kinds of terms in the New Testament. If you read through the New Testament, you start to stumble across them. 
They called it the teaching of the apostles that was held to. That's in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. The pattern of teaching, Paul calls it when, speaking, when, when writing to Rome. He says, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. They call it the word of life. He says to Timothy, guard the deposit. Sound words, it's sometimes called. Or guard the good treasure entrusted to you. Again, to Timothy in the second book of Timothy. A little later in the, t- in the life of the church, it was called the rule of faith. They had all kinds of terms for this gospel, for this central teaching that was being carefully handed down from one generations of Christian, generation of Christians to another. And they took a lot of care with this. Uh, often in the early church, if you were going to get baptized, it wasn't just, hey, I'm ready. It was two years of careful training and teaching to make sure that you understood well the message of the gospel, that you were deeply rooted in Scripture. That is maybe a habit that seems a bit much. Um, That sounds a bit like an undergrad degree. I'm not sure any of us want to do that. But there was a sense in which they were taking it very seriously to pass on that knowledge of the gospel. Um, a monk named a couple of centuries later named Vincent of Lerain said, what is meant by deposit? Well, it's that which is committed to you, not invented by you. Receive, not devise. You're, you're not an author. You're a keeper. So keep the deposit. You're to guard it, not add flourish to it. And there are all kinds of impulses toward coming up with these creeds that came to us now as the Apostles' Creed and a few other creeds that are well known from the early church. It was needed at baptism. It was needed during preaching. You didn't want, when you met someone and you wanted them to understand the gospel, you didn't open up your Bible and say, let's start at the beginning and let's go to the end. You said, I want to talk to you about Jesus. And you were able to tell them what was that message? What was the gospel? During training of new converts and during defending of the faith, it was also important. So this handing over, no matter what the context or the need, it was a good handing over. This pure spiritual milk, which has come down to us, it's good pure spiritual milk, and it's needed by us. Paul was one of those who was a part of this handing over, a part of this being taught on one hand and teaching on the other. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 11, is one of those sort of early creeds, this early, these early I believes that is spoken by Paul. Listen carefully to what he says. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. For I'm the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, but not I, but the grace of God that was within me. You saw that first part. It was handed to me, and I handed it on. And he said it's of first importance. When it was handed to him, that message, he held tight to it, and he did not let go. Now, he's a part of a relay race, and that relay race has been going on for 2,000 years now. There are different legs of the race. There are legs of the race through the Middle Ages, through the Reformation, to now, to you. When you heard the gospel, it was handed to you as a sacred trust. Now, this goes back, uh, this tendency to come up with this creed, to summarize the faith in simple terms that anyone could understand that we can share with each other. This goes back to an ancient impulse that we see in the Old Testament. Over and over again, we see leaders of the faith reciting salvation history in simple terms, and then pointing to where the listeners fit in. Moses did this. 
Joshua did this, Ezekiel, Ezra, Stephen in the New Testament did this. You even see this outside of Scripture. Josephus, who was a turncoat from the Jewish side to the Roman side during the Roman War, he went up to the walls of Jerusalem, while they were def- which they were defending against the, coming, against the Roman armies, and he recited the history of Israel, the salvation history, and then said, here's where your decision fits in. He might have been completely wrong, but what he was doing was following an old tradition. This tendency to summarize the faith in a simple way and say, hey, you're in this story. You're a part of this. The decision you have ahead of you, it matters because you are a part of that salvation history. There's a sense of belonging in the retelling, and it continues on with the creeds. You remember what I just wrote, read? One of those simple creeds that Paul received, very focused on the death and resurrection of Christ. Well, you see what he does at the very end? He says, last of all to me, he sees exactly where he fits in. He knows that this was handed to him. And he is, he's almost overwhelmed by the thought. He, he says, you know, I persecuted the church. Why am I part of this story? I don't get it. How am I a part of this relay race? I should not be here. This doesn't make sense. I'm the least of the apostles. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, is what he says. When you read the Apostles' Creed or Scripture, you're meant to see yourself in the telling. How do you do that? Well, first of all, the Apostles' Creed that I read at the beginning, uh, it's divided into three parts, each starting with, I believe. And it actually comes from the baptismal service, where Jesus had actually told those who were about to preach the word and share the faith all over the world. He'd said in Matthew 28, verse 18, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, each of those was expanded into a part of the creed. The first part, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. The next part is the longest part and should be. The next part tells the story of Christ from the beginning till his rising from the dead and even to his coming again. It tells us the story that receives such richness when you read it in the Gospels. The last part, that's where you fit in. The whole universal church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, your sins, the resurrection of the body, your body, and life everlasting your life. You're meant to see yourself in the telling. The story of the gospel, the good news, your story. Now, this creed is a very simple one. This I believe is a very uh, straightforward and simple one. There there, there are some which are more complex than this. Uh, The same Vincent who I spoke about earlier had this simple catchphrase for talking about this center, this core of our faith. He said, well, it's that which believers have believed everywhere, always, and by all. And he was exaggerating. But this is a common, this is the common faith that's shared all across the world and all through time since the very start. It's a very early expression of the faith. The Apostles' Creed did undergo small changes, but it reflects something that you see back in the very beginning of the early church. Uh, There's an old tale that it was said by the 12 apostles as they stood around or as they sat around ready to scatter to all parts of the earth to preach the word, and that they each said one part of it. And I assume that someone at the end said, hey, we should write that down. That's just a tale. This is not what happened. But the fact that we're called, it's called the Apostles' Creed points back to the fact that there is a strong conviction it goes back to the earliest times. And so we are sharing as we read it, as we think about it, that same faith that was reflected in the beliefs and the actions and the lives of the early Christians. And these aren't just bold, bald statements, each part of this creed. No, there's a a clarity to them, and a clarity that should be reflected in our own confession of faith. But if you take each part of it, you realize that it's meant to point you back to Scripture, 
Each part is just a few words, but take suffered under Pontius Pilate. Well, we get this story from all angles to the four Gospels. We hear of Pilate's efforts to wash his hands, not just physically, but metaphorically. He wanted nothing to do with the death of this man. He wanted nothing to, he wanted no responsibility over the situation. And then we hear that the soldiers, like leopards, were loosed on Jesus to mock him and degrade him, to make fun of him. No one to rein them in. Where was their commanding officer? We don't know. And then we hear of Jesus being nailed to the cross. We hear of sour wine and gall given to him, a mockery of care for the dying. We're meant not just to look at these words, but to go back to Scripture and to see the fourfold expression of the life of Christ in the Gospels. Now, uh, again, traditions. There could be objections, discomfort. Uh, Why do we need this? It's been said creeds are apt to become cages. I don't want to pin down my faith. Uh, Don't box me in. The truth is, whether we like it or not, we all have an I believe. We have a creed. We have a, a core of our being, something that defines us. Howard Osgood once put it, a creed is like a backbone. You need not carry your creed in front of you, but you must have one. So whether it's obvious or not, each of us have an I believe, something which you could summarize in a minute with no notes, something that lies at the basis of your arguments, of your decisions, the pattern of your conversation. And if you were asked to speak to it and say what it is, I think we all might be surprised what actually comes out, what we hear ourselves saying and what we hear others saying. Immanuel Kant said, I know of two beautiful things, the starry skies above my head and the sense of duty in my heart. Well, most of us aren't that poetic. Most of us uh, believe something along the lines of something that lies at our core would be, uh, I believe in calling it like it is. I believe in keeping everyone happy around me as much as I can or I believe in never showing weakness. What's your creed? What lies at the center of your thinking? What do you get into arguments about during a family Thanksgiving dinner, or in the parking lot at church, or at work in the lunchroom? What drives you? What are you passionate about? Well, that's a clue as to what you believe, what your I believe is, what your creed is. It could be really crude. It could be, I believe in ribs and beer on football night, and that it's okay to yell at the ref even when he's right. The things we believe are ridiculous and often not well thought through. But some of us think, oh, well, that's other people. Us, we're Christians. We think, as it's been said, as there was astronomy before the telescope, so there was theology before the Bible. But we're after the Bible, we've read the Bible. Their theology might be crazy. Their creed, their center might be way out there. But us, we have scripture. But the truth is, if you think about it, if you go through that early creed of the, of the early church, that's what's been shared all across the world, you may discover that you're kind of off base with some of these things. You're uncomfortable with some of them. You might find that your spiritual milk What you've been consuming, what you've been craving, is not so pure. And if we were all asked to recite what our fundamental belief is right now as Christians, and we were to recite it in in unity, there would be a wild babble of voices. It would be dissonant. We'd be all over the place. And that's concerning. Pure spiritual milk should be what we're constantly coming back to not what we check in with every once in a while. We have agreed about the fundamentals all across the earth and through history in remarkable ways, but on the other hand, churches have split for remarkable reasons. The wildest things. There have been serious fights that devolved, that fell apart, that caused huge conflict over real things like this, a big church argument over the discovery that the church budget was off by 10 cents. Somebody finally gave a dime to settle the issue, which is great, peacemaker. An argument over whether or not to have gluten-free communion bread. 
It sounds important. An argument on whether the church should allow deviled eggs at a church picnic. We all see the problem there. These don't come within 10 miles of theology. But pick one of those issues in the Bible that you're passionate about, and churches have fought over them. They've created all kinds of splits and anger. History has thousands of examples. There have been fights over whether it's allowed to stroll, go for a stroll on a Sunday, to celebrate great Christmas, to dance full stop. In spite of the example of David, that's not allowed in all places. Whether we can have drums at the worship service, I'm glad we landed on the right side of that issue. It's been said, oh, <laughs> it's been said almost without exaggeration that new denominations have been formed because we couldn't agree on the color of the carpets in the church sanctuary, which is why we have no carpets. There have been all kinds of fights, but the truth is that which unites us should stand at the very center and we should all be passionate about. If we are to be a common body, then we need a common backbone. We're seeing, we're used to seeing uh, when they're taking down buildings, um, they lay charges at the base and we see the whole building come down in, in one shot. And it's great, to, it's exciting to see, right? Uh, they're clearing the spot so they can put up something else. But there's a lot of houses which don't fall in that way. Uh, and that, that's, that's true for, for churches as well. Uh, there are a lot that sort of fall, uh, well, they break one window at a time. They fall one wall at a time. It's when we disconnect from the very roots of our faith and the simple message of the gospel. When we say, well, maybe this part I can give up. It's not central. When we make up our own mind about what's central and what's not. That can happen. And often people don't look around to see it happening. The house falls one wall at a time. And one day they get up, they unzip their tent, walk out, and they realize, oh, I haven't been living in a house. I've been camping on a ruin. And then, of course, what's the next thing you do? Well, you say, well, there's a much more comfortable place to camp over there. You pull up the tent pegs and you take off. The faith falls a bit at a time when you move away from that central core of the gospel that we've been taught, that's been handed to us like a baton, and that we should be holding tight to and sharing with others. Or pull up your tent pegs, your tent pegs and, and, and walk out. We need to be protecting that. Now, of course, uh, we can come at this from all kinds of uh, directions. Uh, some of us um, don't feel like we need to engage our faith in any deep or careful way. Uh, what we feel is that uh, our faith is based on an encounter with Jesus, that we have strong feelings about the roots of our faith, but we don't, when we read the Apostles' Creed, or sort of uncomfortable with parts of it. When we read Scripture, well, we stick with the Psalms because that will keep us comfortable and that won't perturb us. That won't force us to engage with our faith in a real way. Well, if that's the case, then what this is, what, what, I, what I'm talking about when I talk about the Apostles' Creed is a call for you to re-engage with your faith, to ask the hard questions, to dig into Scripture, to get commentaries, to, to find the time and pour in the energy to ensure that your faith is solid. And some of us might think that that's just not a need, but I would remind us of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, where Paul says, pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Maybe you are paying all kinds of close attention to your life, but your teachings... No, not so much. View it as the wings of an airplane. That's like staring at out one side of the airplane. Like when we're flying somewhere, you often get the view of just that one wing and saying, so long as that stays solid, I'm okay. 
that's solid, I'm okay. The other one's on fire, but that one's solid, so I'm okay. Your life and your teachings, those are those two wings to stay afloat in the historic faith that we have been, had handed down to us. It's important to engage with both. And you will save through Christ both yourself and your hearers. You could be on the other side. Everything is, well, in Paul's view, meat to you. You feel like you've graduated from pure spiritual milk. Your creed is five miles long. You have a strong opinion on everything, and you are chomping down on it. In a word, yes, you are concerned about the cause of Christ. Yes, you care, but you've got opinions like you've got hair follicles. If that's the case, you may discover that people don't want to sit down with you and have a discussion. You may discover that you are, in fact, all about tithing cumin and spice, as Jesus put it, and that you're not treating other Christians well because you've forgotten what's at the center of your faith, that pure spiritual milk, that message of the gospel. You may be somewhere in the middle. It points you back to the word when we read the Apostles' Creed. That's what it does. If you only hear the word on Sundays, it's not enough. Take that creed, read through it, and then dive back into Scripture. Let that be your launching pad to dig back into Scripture. Now, of course, maybe you're none of those. Uh, maybe your friend dragged you here, your wife or your husband dragged you here. Well, that creed summarizes a salvation history that starts from the beginning, talks about creation, and leads all the way to the very end of time. But if you remember, what I mentioned is that it zooms in on the middle. It zooms in on the life of Christ, the story of the gospel. It's the story that you need to hear. That's what we call the Coles Notes version, the Wikipedia version, the simple version. But when you read the gospels, that's where you encounter Christ, and that is an encounter that you need to have. It's the pivotal encounter of your entire life. It's the one that changes everything. That's the part that you don't want to miss. And the last part of the creed, well, that tells you the story isn't about someone else. The story is about you. The baton is extended to you. And as you'll discover, it's exactly what Paul called it, the good treasure, and it has no substitute. Amen.